please welcome former IMAX CEO and the current owner and principal of Foster & Crew, Greg Foster. It's nice to be here. Thanks, Sharon, again for including me. Um, we are going to start with some introductions of this panel. These are all uh, very, very professional, well-known, and candid people, so I hope there's some uh, level of um, discovery in this, in this conversation. We're going to start first with Sean Gamble, who is the CEO and President of Cinemark Theatres. Thanks, Greg. No problem. And we're going to do we're going to do an introduction. They're going to do their own introductions when we bring everyone up. Next up is the owner and CEO of Screen Engine, Kevin Getz. And finally, my buddy Josh Goldstein, who is the president of Worldwide Marketing at Warner Brothers Discovery. Excuse me. So let's start with Josh. A quick introduction. Sure, I've been uh, started my career literally in the sort of Jurassic period way back at Sony Pictures, and I'm now at my third studio, and I really is remarkable experience having spent an entire life in theatrical marketing now at Warner Brothers, and I'm just incredibly excited about how the industry has changed and how for me every day is actually a new challenge, a new opportunity. Next is Kevin, but I want to first add and congratulate Kevin. On November 4th, he is receiving the American Cinematheque Award for Power of Cinema. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Kevin Getz, founder and CEO of Screen Engine ASI, a tech-enabled research company. We specialize mostly in film and television and gaming, but we also have uh, other companies that we've acquired along the way that do a lot of work in branding and that kind, of, uh, that kind of ancillary work. I have a book that came out last year. It's a bestseller from Simon & Schuster called Audienceology and a podcast that's, I heard, doing pretty well uh, called Don't Kill the Messenger. Yeah. <laughs> if you understand what I do, it's a very uh, uh, apropos title. Thanks, Thanks Greg. And Sean Gamble, President and CEO of Cinemark Theatres. Uh, well, hi. It's great to be here with all of you and our, uh, our panel here today. Uh, I uh, actually, interestingly, started outside the world of cinema. I spent uh, many years within uh, General Electric uh, in the finance world and then got involved in the entertainment space when they owned NBC. And I was with Universal for close to a decade. Uh, I was five years as CFO there, and that led me to being... Uh, CFO of Cinemark thereafter. I've been with Cinemark almost nine years now and uh, in the CEO role for about two. Awesome. Small fact, Sean was in fact the CFO that I worked for, so uh, he was a, a tough but thoughtful person <laughs> in that space. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, I also want to say that as a consultant, my opinions and questions are completely mine. They do not represent my clients and I wanted to say that just in case anyone wonders if I'm shilling for anyone along the way, which I will not be. Um, so we've had, guys, a, a pretty schizophrenic year. We had an amazing summer, obviously led by Barbie and Oppenheimer, which when you think about it, the fact that those two movies together globally have garnered about two and a half billion dollars, it's just, it's unbelievable. And then we've hit a little bit of the wall. Um, it, obviously the strike is part of it. Um, it's impacted uh, release dates, it's impacted promotion of movies, but let me set a little sort of financial table for you. So year to date, the domestic box office versus last year, and I'm only going to focus on domestic because it's so different in all of the of various countries around the world, but this is more of a, a domestic conversation. The box office is up 26% versus last year, which is amazing, yet it's still down 15% versus the last pre-pandemic year, which was 2019. There's an awful lot to be excited about. There's also some challenges, some of which I just mentioned. I want to start, and I'd love to make this as organic a discussion as we possibly can. I'm going to start with Josh, Barbie. Um, I know you guys heard Enon earlier, but uh, I give Josh such a tremendous amount of credit of being the, the marketing maestro. Thank, thank you very much. And it really was incredible. And I don't think anyone had any idea that it was going to be anywhere close to what it was. And it felt so organic, which is sort of ironic given it's Barbie. But um, it, it was just incredible. So it's been a massive cultural event. It ge it's generated $1.4 plus billion dollars to date. As I mentioned, you were the maestro of all of this from the marketing point of view. How did it happen? 
Well, there's a lot of pieces of it. And I, first of all, and it's a very generous introduction, all marketing is an incredible team sport, and it is a collaboration between every department and how they work together. And in the case, you had Enon this morning, who was, I think, one of the most extraordinary sort of CEOs in his ability to be self-deprecating and, frankly, frankly, to sort of ha you know, allow this brand to be sort of you know, treated in this way. And I think I, I think you spoke about that this morning. But you also had an incredible filmmaker in Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie. And, and so this is all a tremendously collaborative effort. But I think since the theme of today is, is resilience, I think Barbie was a moment of how you know, the culture can respond to theatricality and the value of theatricality. And so how was that, kind of, how was that achieved? I think in this case, it was you had this remarkable, iconic brand that was both a reflector of culture but also a creator of culture. And it had such a long history. And I think there was such a sort of fascination about what a Barbie could be, a Barbie movie could be. In fact, I think literally, um, you know, it had been long in development over many, many regimes at different studios. And I think that Greta Gerwig came to the fore with such a bold and unique vision. And part of our job was to defy expectations and to use cultural curiosity about what this could be. And I think we, you know, very gingerly sort of teased into it. It really started with an early teaser trailer that sort of, you know, lived on the movie Avatar with the theme of sort of 2001 and sort of presented Barbie to the culture in a wildly unexpected way. And I think that sort of began a process. But it, there was also just the casting of Margot Robbie as Barbie and just the fascination. And we saw when we put that first image out into the world, just the cultural curiosity around that. And I think this is a, was, a, uh, was really an example of how theatrical movies can engage the culture and, and how every little aspect of a campaign from the promotions and the way in which fashion embraced pink, it was all the little sort of pieces coming together. And I think, you know, when you think about sort of resiliency and what sort of post-pandemic, you have this opportunity to create a cultural event and, you, and to sort of pierce the zeitgeist. And what, it, what does that mean? It means that you become you know, part of the conversation. And I think that the shared experiences of movies um, in a theatrical space, the fact that we have opening weekends, that sort of tsunami of pink and the empowerment themes of, you know, of, for a female audience that then branched out beyond female audiences. You had a movie that was PG-13 that also both appealed to the very young with sort of moms and daughters, but also appealed to people with an element of nostalgia. Who did I play Barbie with? And I think it was about engaging the culture on so many different levels, which is really part of what marketing and the theatrical experience can create. And I think that what it did show is it defied all expectations. Like, yes, we had some very ambitious goals when we set, set out to do our work, but it exceeded those because the culture picked up a kind of ur urgency and a kind of speed about it that really drove that intensity and urgency. So I think more than anything, it's the possibility of movies marketed and the ability to have a dialogue with culture on a digital level, on a publicity level, on a promotional level, um, and frankly, on a fashion level, on every level. And I think it also just touched something very human at our sort of core um, that was started with females and broadened out. And I think that's the potential of what movies can do. And I think that's the potential of how we're going to keep this art form alive in a collective way, in a really powerful way. So, my, um, just an opinion. Um, Barbie, and in particular, Barbenheimer, to me is an example of why um, we may have challenges, but the, the, the experience of all getting up out of our house and going to a movie and having a shared experience um, sort of transcends all of it. So whenever I get kind of depressed about some of the stuff that I'm reading about, I'm thinking about that. How did Barbenheimer really happen, as much as you know? I, I know it wasn't something that you guys created, but it also wasn't something that you prevented from happening. How did that go down? Well, I think, again, when you have something that is so engaged in, you know, in the culture, and you had two movies on a single release date, and 
on the surface, they couldn't be more different than each other, right? You had one, a kind of serious drama that sort of painted in the tones of apocalypse, and you had on the other side, you had the sort of pink joy delivery system of Barbie, and I think it was that dichotomy. But I think something really remarkable and exciting happened, which is the internet, for the most part, is a tool that really tends to be one of division, right? You're either team this or you're team that. It's you, you know, it's you're for it, you're against it. It's why, you know, the term hater is, you know, becomes such a dynamic, you know, uh, concept within sort of internet dialogue, a tool of outrage. And I think in this particular moment, there was something really kind of extraordinary that happened. I think that instead of it becoming a war between, you know, the dark and the light, between the joy and the seriousness, in fact, it became an opportunity to come together. And I think, you know, it was a couple early comments that were made, you know, I think Tom Cruise made a comment, I think some people online started to sort of pick up on various things that you can see both. And I think that what that ultimately became is, I think it did feed a very, you know, a deeper need and love of movies and of cultural events. And what it means when you do engage the culture at that level, instead of actually creating, oh, one had to win and one had to lose, we both won in a really dynamic and exciting way that I think was just a validation of the experience. You know, you have, you know, you have Taylor Swift from you and Beyonce. They're both having, you know, doing tremendously That's well. That's my in, next question. Yeah, in the, market, <laughs> in the marketplace. You know, first as concerts, but now also with right. movies. But I think the idea that, you know, that these collective experiences, frankly, that also are have wonderful, powerful themes of you know, female strength and empowerment, they've touched a nerve in the culture in a way that's just been very dynamic, and I think it's a, just a win-win in that respect. Great, thank you. Kev, um, you are in the middle of everything. It's, it's actually amazing, and by the way, you should read his book, Audienceology. It's a really, really excellent book. Thank you. Um, with AMC's big announcement of the Taylor Swift and now Beyonce concert, do you think this trend will continue in cinemas? And if so, what are the opportunities that we can take advantage of in a constructive way? Um, there's a, clearly it's, begun, it's really the only way in November and December um, for trailering of Christmas movies to be able to have this big giant audience. Um, is this sustainable? What have you found in, in terms of certain trends that are going on in the business? Because that's what your job is, not only to, to look at right. individual movies, but also to right. kind of forecast and predict six months out, a year out, two years out, et cetera. What, what do you think about the, this Taylor Swift stuff? Well, specifically about Taylor Swift, I, I think that uh, she's at the heart of the zeitgeist right now. And so we're just uh, lucky enough to, or I should say she's lucky enough, to experience the, the benefits of that. Uh, in broader strokes, what's happening at the box office right now seems to be this word event. You know, uh, we've never seen more polarization in the theatrical world as we have now. The haves and have nots. The haves, Barbie, Oppenheimer. Name all the movies that you all have seen in a movie theater. And then you have the have-nots, which are not necessarily not theater-worthy, but they're much smaller. The entire middle has essentially gone to streaming. So the criteria, the entry point to get into a theatrical experience at all is one of elevated whatever it is. So elevated comedy adventure, elevated drama in Oppenheimer's case, elevated horror, back to Smile and The Nun, The Exorcist coming out this weekend. Elevated is the word. If it's not, audiences will not go see it in a theater. It's why comedies have had such a tough time until the next big comedy comes and then suddenly comedies will be the, the thing that uh, is, is in fashion. But if you don't have elements, like Josh spoke, I think, pretty humbly about uh, the fact that um, it happened, it happened. This it was created because the filmmakers created a product that was so irreverent. And I, without talking out of school, I will say that I had worked with Mattel on all of their IP early, I'm talking five years ago, whenever Robbie Brenner arrived there uh, to start a film division. Barbie was a very low testing uh, concept at its core. Think about it. What did it represent? Three years age span, 
uh, and some nostalgia with mothers. And what Robbie did, and Inan did, and what Greta and Noah did, and what Margot did, was changed the DNA of something. And then what Josh did, and forgive me, but it is absolutely true, you changed the DNA of the campaign. How many of you remember that iconic trailer that came out turning Barbie on its ear? The dum bum bum, you know, the throwing the dolls. I mean, it's, it's, it's genius. It changed the DNA and it created an elevated experience. So it prompted moviegoers to say, whoa, and lean in. Lean in for the product and lean in because the marketing materials were so strong and compelling. So they, it was one of the great lessons. It's textbook, guys and ladies. It's textbook in that it is, um, it is an example that you can change the DNA of something and not make it appear as a cash play. They created an experience. If you don't have an experience, it is very difficult to make it theatrically. And the, the kind of corollary to that is for every Barbie, there's 15 or 20 that don't work. So there's so many movies that we've all wanted to see and were excited about, but felt like it was exploitive in a cash grab. Mm -hmm. And this turned its on, its on its ear. So pretty remarkable. And by the way, I just want to say that a year before, Josh, I spoke to Josh, and so did my partner, Bob Levin, um, who's our COO of our company. And he said, I think, you, you listen to me, I think Barbie's going to do... Uh, $50 million opening. Mm. And we're like, are you fucking kidding me? Mm. <laughs> what? What? We had higher goals than that <laughs> from the beginning. But no, I, I'm talking a year <laughs> right, before. But I, do, but I do remember, you know, listen. You were the it, only one who said it was going to do those kinds of numbers. I, 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 I appreciate that. And I think there's an interesting conversation. I want to let Sean talk a little bit, but about what it means to be elevated and how do you then mm -hmm. how, kind of... Can you make anything elevated just by willing it to be the case? I agree. Where, do, you know, where does the DNA sit? And I think Sean sits in this, such a kind of fascinating area as, a, you know, as someone who runs such a successful theater chain. How are you choosing and thinking about the business from your angle? So that's the, that's the perfect segue because you are the connection to the purchase decision, your company. Um, and your company is incredibly well run, always has been. I know that you uh, were there under Zerati, who I'm a who's a dear friend of mine and who's such a professional, so it makes all the sense in the world. But we do have this issue, which is there used to be 160, 170 movies coming out each year. Um, this year we'll get over 100, but maybe just. Um, last year I think it was 85 or 90 or something like that that were, that were wide releases. Um, we have the streaming issue. And is there still space in the theatrical market for these mid-tier movies, and particularly the dramas and the comedies? I know they're adult skewing. No question about it. Oppenheimer turned this thesis on its ear and succeeded. And the fact that it did, I hope it wasn't catching lightning in a bottle, but maybe to some degree because of Chris Nolan, because of the Barbenheimer, it was. But can we get audiences back in the cinemas in a collective zeitgeisty experience for movies that aren't directed by Chris Nolan? Uh, well, look, I, I certainly think we can. Um, I'm also uh, very optimistic about film volume recovering further. I mean, largely due to what we hear from our studio partners in terms of their plans to continue to, to lean more into that and other studios starting to get off the ground in that space. Um, we have plenty of examples I know there's uh, many films that haven't worked post-pandemic, but that was always the case pre-pandemic too. <laughs> there's plenty of examples of adult dramas and family-type films and things of that sort that have performed exceptionally well since, since the pandemic. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that can certainly assist that is ideally a more steady stream. When we get back to a more regular flow of volume and having more films for those types of audiences, um, I believe you know, that will lead them to perhaps come more frequently because we see that momentum build. Like you see it over the course of the summer when there's more films in the marketplace, people tend to start going out more and it, it builds upon each other a bit. And when we've been dealing with these starts and stops, it's almost like you gotta reboot the engine 
each time you go through one of these you know, yeah. small droughts. Yeah, so, I think there's no question that habit plays a role and you can kind of get into a movie going habit. But I think something that sort of was echoed in, in what Kevin said, right, what is elevated? And I do think that if the movie is not an event for someone, it's a movie for no one. And I do think that, you know, that there's a different type of urgency in a world that has so many streaming options. That doesn't mean there can, there can be an incredibly robust and exciting theatrical you know, uh, slate of movies you know, for e a given studio for across the industry. But I do think as we think about what makes something theater worthy, you, know, you have that sort of notion of, from Kevin, elevated. I do think we have to, it has to feel special and distinguish itself. Someone and, has to own it. There has to be an audience that yeah, owns that movie. There has to be an, a large get, enough audience. Yeah, but, there has, but even there can be a, a, a rather specific audience, but can be very deep, right? We've seen horror movies that are not, you know, horror movies are the, are the genre that you're either an acceptor or a rejecter, but it's a great theatrical experience to your term, and if you can drive the essential elements of urgency, right, you're driving fear, you're driving an experience, if you can create that, what is elevated, what is an event, is those movies that can communicate that to the culture, and you do that sometimes through the DNA of the movie itself, and sometimes through the role of marketing to unlock that potential, and I think how how we do that and how we think about it, we have to have movies that have that potential. But the flip side of it is, is that, you know, I think what gives all of us, especially at Warner Brothers, a lot of optimism, is that the theatrical experience, when you have, you know, when you have these wonderful, unique voices, when they are making movies, not necessarily the biggest movies, they can be of very different sizes, but they have a passionate group mm -hmm. that is committed to them and they're marketed with passion and they can differentiate themselves. You have a lot of reasons to sit home on a couch and we're gonna give you a reason to get off your ass and into a theater in a really exciting and dynamic way. Jeff, and that's, you wanna say that's, something? Yeah, I wanna add to that because um, we're experiencing something that we've never experienced, a disruption that has never been um, the same in other words, we've had the home entertainment disruption, more movies begot more movies. We had this, the cable proliferation and all the streamers, uh, all the, um, not the streamers, but the uh, you know, smart TV and, 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 uh, and, and packages and Netflix mail order and so forth. We could survive that more, more became, begot more. But this is the streaming disruption and we're not going to survive it the way we did. It's just not happening. We are going to go to movies, we're going to see movies, but we're not gonna see them in the same way and we're not gonna see them in the same quantity because of three main issues that came together for the very first time. They've all existed, but finally, price, convenience, and choice. Price, convenience, and choice. And price is, look, the, the, it's too expensive to go to a movie theater when you have so much choice. It just is, it's 60, 80 bucks to go to a movie, 80, 80 something dollars for a family of four to go to see one movie with concessions, et cetera. When you have the free cinema day, my God, oh, not free, what, how much was it? Four bucks. Four bucks, you saw them come out. You saw people come out. So it's not just one issue, but that's one main issue. Because then you tie that to the convenience. It takes average of, I think it's 34 minutes to leave your house, drive to the theater, go to the theater, as opposed to 14 minutes to pick the movie that you're gonna see on streaming <laughs> and watch the movie. And then choice, my God, you've got, six movies in a multi 14 plex and you've got thousands of movies here that you can see so the younger particularly gen z and the um millennials have changed the 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 landscape forever we have a certain nostalgia with movies we had our first kiss our first party uh, whatever with movies and you had a relationship with the theater Mm -hmm. Young people don't have that relationship with the theater. They simply don't. They do want to see certain movies. More people are actually going to go to the movies as the population increases, but they're going to be seeing far, far fewer titles. So I'm, I since, would, since the theme... I would add to okay. That. I'll just say, I think since, since the theme here is resilience, and I, and I think you know, you're definitely pointing at concerns and issues as they, as they exist, but what I will say is what we've shown is that when you actually 
create something of value. And I think that there's a value proposition of a theatrical movie. People are not staying away because of price. The, you know, yes, there's lots of other choices. What's, the trick is, is it's our job to find those extraordinary storytellers right. who want to tell stories on a big screen in a way that delivers that experience. And I think that, frankly, a great movie experience is probably one of the great economic values of all time. Agreed. And on top of that, what you also have is that the young, you know, those, you know, of a different generation, and I believe that people can experience movies, you know, I happen to love seeing them in a theater, but if you see them in other, you know, venues, they have greater value. That's the point. They do better on streamers when they've been in theaters. They do better in every revenue stream down the road. So the point is, is that the theatrical experience, the sense of cultural engagement, you know, the problem is, is so much, there's so much sort of volume that sort of comes and goes in the digital space. And the point is, great stories, you know, and great filmmakers really have the opportunity to tell these stories in a way that matters. And I think when they matter, then they have these other lives. And, you know, and it's why, you know, one of the things I probably should have also said about Barbie is it really was such a company-wide, you know, priority. I mean, I work at Warner Brothers, we have a streaming service and all that, but the company recognized, you know, the value of this property and everyone worked together. It was the networks, we had Barbie dream houses on our cable networks. It was all everyone working together. And the value of that and the understanding of that was the belief and the actual business sense that the, by all working together to support this great product, we then were creating something that then could live in other areas of the company. And may, it'll matter more on streaming because it was yep. this kind of theatrical experience. So, okay. Sean, I one comment on yeah, that? no, I want you to, I, because you're, again, you're yeah. where the purchase decision is made. So pricing, the, 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 the importance of directors like Greta Gerwig and Chris Nolan, what value does that have for you? Yeah, well, and I was gonna, I was gonna comment on the value, because you know, the, other, the other big, uh, thing that's happening now too is right is word of mouth spreads faster now than it ever did mm -hmm. right so when we talk about certain the haves and have nots of films uh, we've seen this dynamic of films that aren't working are dropping a lot faster but then again films that are working that word gets out and they're running a lot longer now maybe some of that's the volume you know piece of volume being down but we've seen that trend over and over and over again too so you come back to the value play, there really is, I agree, there's, you know, there's a need to eventize things, there's a need for compelling content so that word of mouth can spread and lure people in. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about things like price and the, the overall entertainment experience that our guests are having because we don't want that perception to be out there that it's expensive. The reality is when you compare it with other forms of how you could spend your time and other forms of entertainment, it's not like relative to other out of home choices that consumers have to make. So it's just part of what we need to do just to continue to make sure that's yeah. understood. I think, it just, I think what it there does, are higher Greg, highs oh, and lower lows. What I was gonna say, yeah. it just makes the consumer who's in the driver's seat now, you have to remember that's the thing. Mm -hmm. the, it used to be us telling you, guys, you, people, three movies opening this weekend, choose a movie. Mm -hmm. You don't wanna go, don't go to the movies. But that's what you did, period. Now, we can't say that. There's so much more. And in the ecosystem of the consumer, that's what's changed. It hasn't been the movie theaters. It hasn't been the studios. It's the consumer that's changed. And until and unless we understand that and embrace that and really go with what the consumer is telling us they want, need uh, to experience and consume, they want to go to the movies. Let me make no mistake about it. But they want to see things that make them leave their home. You know. I'm just gonna say a really quick thing. My world changed when, five years ago, when I, we were, my husband and I were staying in the Hamptons. I know, it's already like, uh, that's like that comment, that's like that comment that, Ke that Kevin, they said, oh, Kevin Cuss couldn't be here because he, the Santa Barbara, the rains or something. No, we were in the hand, we, we, I, I was having a scotch in the pool, I was really relaxed, and we wanted to go see a Sofia Coppola movie or something like that, and somebody said, eh, I think Bob said, well, you know, it's not, it's okay. And I went, okay. We had just seen Dunkirk and Spider-Man in that little East Hampton theater, which is a friggin' pain in the ass to get to. So, you know, so we, we uh, knew it was gonna be an effort. Well, Handmaid's Tale was on. And I'm like, I heard about this thing. Well, we put Handmaid's Tale. I said, as I'm going into the shower, I said, Neil, can we not go to the, can we not go to the movies? Can we watch Handmaid's Tale? All right. So we stayed home. 
And I watched three episodes back to back and thought it was one of the most extraordinary experiences. And I didn't regret doing that one bit. And it changed my way of thinking about what was worth my time to get in that shower, leave the comfort of the home, get to that drive, get in the theater. Give me an experience, give me a reason to go, and I'm there. And so are most people. Yeah. And that, listen, none of us would put, want to put our heads in the sand and kind of ignore the reality of Kevin Hampton's experience. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you love what you do, there are extraordinary storytellers, and I'm really privileged to work with, you know, two my the two heads of the motion picture group at, at Warner Brothers. You know, are former producers and real filmmakers, and you know, live to work with great filmmakers and great storytellers. And yes, th there's no question. There's lots of great streaming content, and how the streaming business works uh, out. Its economics is the topic for another, you know, another discussion. But there is still something special here. And we have, you know, just great evidence. Yes, the highs can be, you know, the truth is there's no floor sometimes if things don't work and you have to be really smart about the business. I will say part of what keeps me on my toes and all of us on our toes is, you know, when we started in the 90s, it was a little bit, you know, it was a little simpler. The DVD business kind of coming out of the ecosystem has made some of the economics more challenging. But the fundamental assignment of engaging the human animal. We are a herd species, you know, and I say that in a very positive way, which is when we as a culture and as a group get excited, we move en masse and, and get kind of in these collective stories and experiencing them together. It again, you know, you can think of these great movies, you know, I just, I'm not saying that great work isn't done in those other spaces, but movies as a sort of three act storytelling device live in that sort of theatrical venue in a way that is just uniquely powerful. And I just think it, it, that experience drives the economics yeah. and will be part of hopefully their business for a long time to come. Well, I agree. I think we are out of time. The one thing I want to add though is you've spoken, we've all kind of spoken in a way about directors. And I think the one thing that the movie business has, it was completely how I built my IMAX business was hitching the wagon to the best directors out there. And I think that the movies that really succeed, Chris Nolan has become a brand. Obviously, Greta Gerwig is now a brand. There's so many of those incredible directors. And, and those are the things that I think make your job easier mm -hmm. when there's someone who actually made the movie, starred in the movie, who we get excited about going and seeing what they're up to. So here's to great directors and great stories and, and lots of movie going in the future. Thank you very much.